the reason I spent so much time <clears throat> talking about um, how you can't just talk. It, it's totally fine to talk about the world of the story as if it were real, um, but you also got to talk about who made it and who's watching it and why it was made this way and what people watching it get out of it. It's really important to do this. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's something worth spending a lot of time because honestly, it's the difference between a simpler way of understanding art and a more complex way of understanding art. Um, and again, I want to be clear, don't throw away the simple way and replace it with a complicated way. Do both. Why? This class, the whole point of this class is to put tools in your toolbox. What job are you trying to do? You're trying to understand art. You're trying to understand literature. This is introduction to literary studies. So you're trying to do that. So in order to do that, you're going to need some tools in your toolbox. So this is one of the tools. One of the tools I just gave you is Plato. Plato is a tool that will help you understand art um, and help you understand discussions about art, which are a repeat of the conversations Plato was having. And it gives you the whole philosophy behind why that's occurring. The other tool, what other tool I just gave you, which you're going to need from this series of videos, is to always remember someone is making this. What are they trying to do? Someone is watching this. What are they getting out of the experience? Um, and that's we're going to cover that more as we go, because, of course, as you notice, the person making it is the author. The next unit will be art after we finish. Uh, the first unit is art and reality. Unit number two is art and authors. And then unit number three is art and audiences. <clears throat> but I want to introduce the concept now so that you get used to it, because it, it for a lot of my students, they whenever I, I, I insist, I say, you got to do this in your papers. And then I get papers and students don't do it. I have a theory as to why they don't want to do it. It's kind of sad. Um, and I, but I get it. I totally get it because I'm the same way. I think a lot of my students, when they, they watch movies and TV shows or whatever to kind of escape into a different reality, and they want it to be real. They want it to be a real place. And so they love to talk about, can Superman go faster than the Flash? But it's less pleasant to talk about how the director of the movie quit and they put a different director and he changed a lot of the movie to be right. They don't want to think about that because that reminds them that the story's not real. Um, because it's a, because if somebody's making it, then it's not real and it's harder to live in that world. So it's a, it's a slightly uh, advanced move, but it's one that my students have a lot, a lot of trouble with. Um, and there's a million examples I could give you of this, you know, all day long. Um, for example, there's two different kinds of comic book fans. Um, some comic book fans just like to buy every issue of something. So let's say you're an X-Men fan, you just buy every issue of the X-Men because you want to know what's going to happen to the X-Men next. I don't do that. I read the X-Men when I like the author. When the author leaves the book, I don't read the next issue of the X-Men. I read the next issue written by the author. So if he writes the X-Men and then he quits the X-Men and he starts writing for Wonder Woman, I'm going to follow Wonder Woman because I'm interested in seeing what the author is doing next, not what the characters are doing next. The characters aren't real. Um, what I'm interested in is who's making it and are they doing a good job? So I, if I like an artist, I want to read comic books. I read it for the author and I read it for the, for the artist. Um, and when the author and the artist go to a different project, I follow them over there. And when they replace them, I don't just keep reading the X-Men forever, no matter who's writing it. Um, I'm interested in sort of, uh, the way it's being created. Um, so we'll talk more about this as the semester goes. Um, but do I want to do one more example? Maybe I'll do one more example. Um, if you've seen The Incredibles, um, no, it's too complicated. The Incredibles is really complicated. I'll save that one for later, actually. Um, all right, cool. You can, you can bother me about, remind me about The Incredibles later and I'll talk about it later. So, um, the last thing I think I'm going to do today before we move on to our next philosopher is I want to talk about Hamlet a little bit more, just to do kind of a, a brief introduction about what the hell is going on in Hamlet. Um, the important thing to understand about Hamlet is that it's a type of play that people had seen a million times before. It's called a revenge tragedy. And just like when we go to the movies and we just watch a hundred superhero movies, um, that's like all, that's basically most of what you can see in Hollywood blockbusters is superhero movies. Um, and the Fast and the Furious is basically a superhero movie at this point. They're gigantic men who are indestructible. How is that not Superman? Um, the Rock, I think at this point could beat up Superman and maybe Vin Diesel too. I don't know. Um, the, when we go, we see superhero movies. Well, back in Shakespeare's day, they saw revenge movies, revenge tragedies, plays about revenge. So the interesting thing about revenge tragedies is that they're pretty simple, right? Somebody destroyed your family and you got to get revenge on them, right? So the, the, what makes Hamlet fascinating is it should be a pretty simple play. Um, and actually, the, one of my favorite quotes anyone's ever said about Shakespeare was a, a Shakespeare professor from the 1950s named Harold Goddard. And Harold Goddard said, and this is this this will only make sense to some of you, but if you know Othello, this will make a lot of sense. Harold Goddard said, if you took the character of Hamlet and the character of Othello and you switched them, 
like so that Othello was in Hamlet's play and Hamlet was in Othello's play, those plays would be over in about 10 fucking minutes. They'd be fast. Why? Well, because if, if you know the story of Othello, it's, a, it's a, basically a, a, an evil man convinces Othello that his wife is cheating on him, and Othello becomes so upset that he murders his wife. Uh, and then when he realizes he's killed an innocent person, he kills himself. Uh, that's the story of Othello. Um, and why the evil man does what he does is a much more complicated conversation that I'm not covering in this class, but if you took 201 with me, you know all about it. Um, he's basically like the Joker from Dark Knight. So the point is, is this guy was saying that if you switch the characters out, um, the plays go real differently because Othello is, he's a, he's, a, he's a general, he's a soldier, he likes action. So imagine Othello in the play Hamlet and the ghost comes and says, I'm Othello, uh, your, your uncle murdered me and get revenge. Othello would be like, okay, shit, I'm going to go get revenge. And he would go right over there and he would stab the fuck out of Claudius, act one, scene two, plays over. Um, it'd be so fast. Um, similarly, if you put Hamlet in Othello, um, the bad guy in Othello, how does the bad guy destroy Othello? He talks to him, he tricks him with words. Nobody in the history of literature could, he's, Hamlet is the only person in the history of literature that could out-talk Iago. Hamlet never shuts up. Um, I can't even imagine Iago would be able to get anything done. Iago would be like, Hamlet, I think your wife is cheating on you. And Hamlet would be like, boy, isn't that, aren't people terrible everywhere? I hate this place. I'm so sick of this terrible earth where everything is disgusting and ruined. What is even the point? And he wouldn't even bother getting up to go kill Desdemona. He just wouldn't do anything. He's, the whole thing's fucking stupid. Um, I say this because to understand what's going on in Hamlet, you have to understand what kind of character Hamlet is. Um, Hamlet's a real simple play, theoretically. It's this guy killed your dad. Kill him. And it's supposed to be where he goes and gets revenge in complicated ways. What makes Hamlet crazy what makes the play Hamlet a, a bizarre thing is that Hamlet is fundamentally the wrong guy for this job. Hamlet is a bit like taking a nerdy philosophy student. Imagine taking a really nerdy philosophy student and having him be John Wick. You see how that wouldn't go very well because nerdy philosophy students don't want to kill a bunch of people. They're not good at it. They don't even really like it. And they spend their time thinking about philosophy like Plato said they should. Um, so if you had, if, if John, John Wick is great at being John Wick because he's the perfect guy for the movie he's in. The movie is about killing people and getting revenge. And John Wick is real good at killing people and getting revenge. But Hamlet is not, he has the wrong personality type for this. Um, he is an intellectual. He would rather think big thoughts and feel big emotions and think about philosophy issues like, is the world even worth living in? And what is the point of anything anyway? Um, he's completely the wrong guy. Plus, he seems like pretty depressive. Um, this is not who you want in your action movie. So everything that goes, one way of thinking about Hamlet and everything that goes wrong in Hamlet is it's because Hamlet's the wrong guy for this job. Um, he is too emotional. He is too, he feels too much and he thinks too much. He's not an action guy. He's an emotion and a thinking guy. He's a brain and a heart guy. He's not a hand guy who's going to solve problems with his fists. And that's the tragedy of the play. Um, the whole play is basically, it's interesting. Because the play's standard. Everybody knows what the play's supposed to be about. It's, there, there's tons of these like this. Just get revenge. Um, but it's fascinating to watch Hamlet struggle with things that other people in the past have not struggled with. He has a very strange reaction to the task that the ghost gives him, and he just simply, he simply doesn't want to do it. Um, there's a lot more we can say about Hamlet, but I just, I think that's one of the more important ways of thinking about Hamlet. Because um, you watch the play and you're like, what the fuck was the point of that? Um, it's a study of a certain kind of over-intellectual, over-emotional, manic-depressive person who is just in the wrong situation. And that's what makes it a tragedy. Whereas John Wick, everything goes really well for John Wick. And that's why it's an exciting action movie because the character fits the play he's in, but, or the movie, but Hamlet doesn't fit the story that he's in. And so disaster. So I got some videos uh, from Legion for you to watch to think about Plato. Uh, I think that's the end of class today, um, but I will see you guys soon. Um, I'm going to see you in five minutes because I'm going to film the next one immediately, but you will see me in a little while. Uh, and I will... Uh, uh, I'll talk to you more about the next philosopher, who is a guy named Sir Philip Sidney from Shakespeare's Day. Uh, okay, thank you!